Hi, John here. Today we're going to look at a pressure vessel. Specifically, we're going to look at an unfired pressure vessel. And I'm going to tell you about its construction, its terminology, and some of the appendages or the fittings that you're likely to have on the pressure vessel itself. Pressure vessels are classed into two main groups. These are fired pressure vessels and unfired pressure vessels. Fired pressure vessels are things such as boilers, and unfired pressure vessels, as the name implies, are pressure vessels that are not connected with any sort of steam generation or anything that has a flame. So they're unfired pressure vessels. The example we're looking at now is based on an unfired pressure vessel used for a compressed air system. The typical pressure for this system we're going to imagine is 8 to 10 bar. Many factories and plants around the world use about 6 to 8 bar or 6 to 10 bar generally and they'll call this service air or working air and this is what they use for their power tools etc. But before they can use it for their power tools, this pneumatic air, it's going to be stored in this pressure vessel, sometimes referred to as an air receiver or a buffer tank. As you can see it's cylindrical in shape, there are no sharp edges. The reason there are no sharp edges is because this pressure vessel is going to hold pressure and we don't want any stress raisers. When I talk about stress raisers, I'm talking about an area in the tank where the stress is going to be higher on the material than in another area. Now stress raisers do exist when we construct the tank, that just happens. We can see on the top that these pipes here, around the base of the pipes, they will represent areas of stress or stress raisers. And in order to install the pipe that we're looking at now, we have to cut a piece of metal out of the main shell. The shell is the exterior parts of the pressure vessel itself, so that would include the round ends, often referred to as dishes, and the longitudinal cylinder, which joins the two ends together. So that's all referred to as the shell. We can have a look at the top. We can see two large pipes, one on the right and one on the left. Now these two large pipes are going to be for compressed air coming in and compressed air going out. The two smaller pipes on the inside are going to be used for appendages. And when I talk about appendages, I mean pressure gauges, such as a board on pressure gauge, so we can see what the pressure is within the tank. We're also likely to have what we call a differential pressure switch. That will send a signal to the compressor telling it when to turn on or off. So if we're reaching 8 or 10 bar, we then want the compressor to shut off and then we'll maintain this pressure and as people use the compressed air the pressure will drop and once it drops to let's imagine 6 bar the compressor will cut back in again. That's what the differential pressure switch is doing. If there is a valve isolating the safety relief valve from the main tank we're very likely to have a fusible plug. In fact I'm pretty sure this is legislation in most countries so you'll need a fusible plug and that will be mounted also at the top of the tank. We're going to look at each of these pieces in a bit more detail later on. Let's just continue our little review of the tank construction. You can see here we've got a manhole. The manhole allows us to open the tank, go inside and do an inspection, as well as for general cleaning of the tank. You may not have a manhole, you may have a handhole or a sight hole. But the general idea is that you can see the condition inside the tank and ideally you'll be able to put your hand in there and clean the tank or climb into the tank and clean it. The tank itself represents what they call an enclosed space. That means you absolutely should not open the tank and climb in and start cleaning. There's a strong possibility or a strong likelihood that there's not enough oxygen in there for breathing. So normally you would open one of these tanks, vent it for 24 hours and when you do climb in you will have an oxygen probe in front of you and you'll be measuring the oxygen content it within the air constantly. Please don't open up a pressure vessel or any other enclosed space and just climb in. In the past there's been a lot of deaths associated with people doing that and that's the reason why there's so many laws, legislation and good practices now to avoid this. Let's go further down and look at the last two pieces on the tank. The pipe at the bottom of the tank here, this is for a condensate drain. Compressed air systems nowadays have a dryer and the dryer removes moisture from the compressed air after it leaves the compressor. However, if your dryer should malfunction or maybe you don't even have a dryer, 
you'll need a condensate drain and you'll need to drain the moisture or the condensate out of the bottom of the tank. And to do this, you'll use either an automatic condensate drain or you'll use a manual condensate drain valve, which I'm going to show you later. If we zoom out, I can show you the reason why we would drain the condensate drain in the first place. We just take a cross section. Our tank here appears on the inside to be covered in some sort of epoxy or resin. And this is an added barrier to corrosion. So this will stop or minimize the corrosion within our tank. Normally, on the inside of the pressure vessel, you will see a plain steel construction and there will be no coating on the inside of the tank. In very rare cases, you may even see stainless steel, but that's where you need to guarantee the purity of the air. So stainless steel tanks are quite expensive and they're employed mostly in the medical industry or the electronics industries. We zoom down here, we can see the drain. There's our pipe at the bottom and condensate would be drained from the lowest point in the tank, which is where the pipe is. If we allow condensate to build up within the tank, it's very likely we're going to have corrosion on the inside of the tank or pitting. And this is obviously not good. We don't want any corrosion or pitting to occur on the shell of the tank. If I zoom in further, we can see that the shell has a defined thickness. This is this area here from top to bottom. That is the shell thickness. Any corrosion or pitting that occurs in this area is going to reduce the thickness and that is going to reduce the strength of the material. So we have to maintain a minimum thickness at all times, ideally a lot more, so we have a safety factor. The feet, as you can see on the left and right here, are constructed to absorb vibration. The tank itself is going to sit usually on some sort of soft rubber mat or carpet. And within a factory or plant, usually we have a lot of vibration from different machines. So this sort of soft bed gives the tank a nice stable foundation without all the vibration. But it also lifts the tank off the ground and ensures the tank base itself doesn't get wet, which can also lead to corrosion. When you're maintaining these vessels, the things to look out for are the welds along the base of the pipeworks or any appendages, as well as the welded seams in the longitudinal direction or maybe on the end plates or the dishes. Aside from performing visual inspections and looking inside the tank maybe once a year or once every two years, the tank can also be inspected with non-destructive testing techniques and that way you can determine the strength of the welds or the condition of the welds which are very much the weakest point on the vessel and the thickness of the shell etc. But generally you'll only use non-destructive testing techniques if the vessel is quite critical or if legislation demands this and that depends on which country the pressure vessel is installed in. Pressure vessel legislation is very strict in most countries nowadays and almost all companies that will be purchasing pressure vessels conform to modern standards. And this may be standards set down by ASME in America or the British Standard in the United Kingdom or TUF in Central Europe. Let's have a look now at some of the appendages that we talked about earlier and some of the items that you likely see mounted onto the pressure vessel. So here we can see a safety relief valve. This is not the type of safety relief valve that you are going to see on a unfired pressure vessel. It's actually taken from one used for a boiler. But I just want to show you the general principle so you can understand how a safety relief valve works. Essentially, the bottom of the safety relief valve would be connected, for example, to a pressure vessel. The pressure from the system is exerted here. And what will happen is, the pressure, if it gets too high, will push the valve lid upwards. Once that occurs, the pressure is effectively venting to atmosphere. We can see that here, the pressure would force the valve lid upwards, and then the system would vent to atmosphere through the large pipe that we can see on the right. We can control at what pressure the valve lifts by using a spring. The spring shown here has a certain tensile strength. Now, if we wanted to push that spring together, it's going to require a certain amount of force. The pressure within the system applies this force and it will push the valve lid upwards and the associated rod 
and it will compress the spring. Now the spring's been specifically chosen to start being compressed at that lift pressure or at that pressure. And once the pressure reduces again, the spring will expand and it will again put the valve lid onto the valve seat and it will isolate the system from atmosphere. This is known as a spring loaded safety relief valve. As I said before, this one here is for a steam generator. So this would normally be used to release steam in the event of overpressure. But the principle behind a spring loaded safety relief valve is exactly the same for a unfired pressure vessel like the one we looked at earlier. The only difference being that the whole thing will be scaled down and the valve will be a lot smaller. Let's now go and have a look at a board on gauge. This is what you'll use for local pressure indication. Here we can see the inside of a board on gauge. If I go down, I can show you from underneath. The board on gauge is connected to the system through this hole in the bottom. And as the pressure increases, the capillary tube around the outside will expand and this will pull a lever and rotate a gear assembly and the end result is that the pressure indicating needle will turn. I'll just show you that now. We can see here the red needle on the front of the board on gauge. If the pressure was to increase then this red needle will begin to turn in a clockwise direction. If the pressure were to decrease then it would go in the opposite direction. So that's a board on gauge which you use for local pressure indication. Next we'll have a look at a fusible plug. So here we can see a fusible plug. The fusible plug screws directly into the tank itself. And if I take a cross section here, we can see the black gray area in the middle. What will actually happen is if the pressure vessel is exposed to high temperature, for example from a fire, then the black area in the middle of the plug will melt and then we will release the pressure within the pressure vessel to atmosphere. Usually, not always, but usually, where you're venting the pressure to through the fusible plug will be to another remote location. And the reason is, if this plug melts and you do have a fire around the pressure vessel, that compressed air coming out of the plug will just feed the fire and it may also contain some sort of oil vapor or oil carryover from the compressors. So that's what we don't want. We don't want to vent all of that out and directly into the surrounding fire. So what we'll have is a fusible plug that melts and then we'll vent the pressure through a long pipe to a remote location, probably just to outside the building, and that'll release the pressure then in a safe way. And now finally, we can go and have a look at a ball valve which we use as a condensate drain. So here we have a standard ball valve. Now a ball valve is ideal as a condensate drain on the pressure vessel because we just want to turn the lever 90 degrees on the top or the handle which is here and when we do that we will drain condensate from the pressure vessel and if there's no condensate then we'll just drain compressed air. I'll just explode it outwards and we can see the ball valve here. So if we turn that 90 degrees, the ball valve in the middle there will be totally closed. And if we turn it 90 degrees the other way, then it will be totally open. Ball valves are ideal for condensate drains, just because normally getting to these drains, it can be a little bit difficult. And if you're crawling underneath the pressure vessel, you just want to turn the lever to open it, do a check, make sure there's no condensate, and then close the lever again. So that was a brief video introducing unfired pressure vessels and some interesting parts and appendages. If you've got any questions or comments, please do let me know. Thanks very much for your time.